Thank you all for joining us this morning uh, for what I hope will be a real discussion and not our speakers speaking to you, but an in, a really interactive dialogue on the current system and its impacts on public health. Uh, as the program says, and it's true, my name is Marion Standish, and I'm uh, with a foundation in California called the California Endowment. Uh, we are what's called a health conversion foundation, and so our primary interests are health, and I say that quite broadly. Our view is really grounded in the notions of what we call the social determinants of health, so that what happens in a doctor's office, even your genetic makeup is probably the smallest piece of what determines your health for the long run. Uh, we primarily work in the United States, but our interest in uh, the food system, and of course the role of California in the food system, really brings us together with our partners in the Global Alliance, as Ruth has talked about earlier, to try to do something more significant, uh, have greater collective impact on the overall global system uh, than we might otherwise be able to have uh, in California on our own. Uh, it's very exciting. I will introduce the speakers in a moment, but I just want to take uh, the privilege of the moderator to make set some contextual uh, comments and put them on the table. Just in terms of process, as I mentioned, each speaker will come up and do their presentation. They have about seven minutes, uh, no more than 10 minutes for each presentation. I think we should let them all do their presentations and then have conversation after that. It'll be, I think, much more dynamic. Um, as we think about uh, public health and as we think about externalities and the costs of the current food system to public health, consider these questions and we will explore them as we engage in our conversation. What do we really know currently about the externalities related to public health? What don't we know? Of course, this is huge. <laughs> I just want to stay here. This is such a wickedly complex set of issues, particularly if we look at public health broadly and not just the biomedical issues related to public health, which I hope we will talk about as we enter into this conversation. Are there efforts underway to value externalities related to public health? What do we know about them? And what methods are being used to assess externalities? I think one of the big challenges we have when we think about methods is that from a health perspective, uh, the methodology is very limited because most of the impacts are so far out uh, in terms of timing. And particularly if we th think of chronic disease, uh, which is so diet related, uh, how we measure that could be 10, 20, 30, 50, 100 years out. And what are the tools that we have? Um, and most importantly, what policy mechanisms are available or can we create? to begin to internalize external costs associated with these externalities. I, I would just add one other question, which wasn't on my prescribed list of questions, but I think how we talk about this issue, and one of the speakers in the film mentioned this, people hear this concept of externalities, true costs, nobody wants to pay more for anything. I think we know that. Um, how do we talk about this? And I, I think we can infuse that conversation into what we talk about. Um, my experience in this field has been quite a, a long journey. And I just want to put this in context in terms of our conversation. Um, I, I spent most of my early career as a legal services lawyer working on behalf of farm workers in California. I spent about 20 years doing that. And I think it is um, not at all coincidental, and one of the social issues we'll talk about in another workshop, but I think is related to our public health conversation, that California, which we think of as a great technology state and our big export is technology, and it's such a rich state, and it is. But really the biggest export of California is agriculture. 
and it is an enormous agricultural state with tremendous bounty. Uh, and that tremendous bounty is found in two counties. I mean, it's found in many, but most notably in two counties of the state, in what's called the Central California uh, region. And while those two counties are the richest in terms of agricultural bounty, they are the poorest in every other measure that you can imagine. They represent the poorest people in the state who have the poorest health outcomes across any single measure that you could put forward. They have limited access to potable water, even in a state like California. They not only pay for their water through a water bill, but they have to go and buy the water that they actually can drink. I think the coincidence, not at all, of these issues is part of the challenge that we face in talking about food systems and public health. It is a very wicked challenge and one that is intertwined with our health status, with the communities that we live in and how it, those communities impact our health, whether it's from poor air quality or poor water. Um, these are enormous issues. So I encourage all of you as we hear from these uh, speakers to think about the breadth of the issue. That's not to say ultimately we're gonna have to shrink it because we can't do everything. But what are the essential issues that should be included when we explore the impacts of the food system on public health? How do we really think about, I mean, the one issue I've been working on for certainly the last uh, 15 years is chronic disease. And chronic disease as the uh, primarily determined by diet is really the condition that will kill many, many millions and millions of people across the globe, not just in the developed countries where we think people are eating too much, but where we are exporting uh, poor quality food around the globe so that uh, people are getting way too much sugar, salt, and fat in ways that are gonna harm them. So just with that as sort of the privilege of <laughs> my moderating, uh, set a little bit of context, I'm really pleased to introduce our speakers. And I don't know that we have any particular order, but uh, I have a little order here. And I, Pete, if you don't mind speaking first, let me introduce Pete Myers. I'll introduce everybody, and then you can come up and speak um, one after another. Pete uh, Myers is the founder and CEO and chief scientist of Environmental Health Sciences, which is a not-for-profit organization founded in 2002 to increase public understanding of the scientific links between environmental factors and human health. Uh, Pete holds a doctorate in biological sciences from UC Berkeley and from Reed College. Uh, for 12 years, beginning in 1990, uh, Pete served as director of the W. Alton Jones Foundation in Charlottesville, Charlottesville Virginia. And he has written a number of books, including Our Stolen Future, uh, that explores the scientific basis of concern for how contamination threatens fetal development. He's going to talk to us primarily about endocrine disru disruption in human health, and I'm really pleased to invite him uh, to the podium. I have no idea how old this is. <laughs> so, a slide, excellent. Thank you, Marianne. That was a great introduction set up for my comments this morning. Um, we're here to talk about health externalities and what this might be costing us economically. Um, I, I think the situation we're in, and, and I'm pretty confident as the day goes forward, will converge on this uh, perception. It's, if you, you can imagine we're heading towards some hills, but they're covered in fog, and you don't know if it's the Blue Ridge of Virginia or the Rocky Mountains of Colorado or the Himalayas in India and China. But you know that something is back there lurking and it's big. That's the situation we're in. We don't know how big they are, which one of those mountain ranges it is, but we know the costs are real and they are likely to be big. People die as a result of the use of pesticides in industrial agriculture. People have immune system disorders. Kids are born with 
IQ deficits that hinder them throughout their, their productivity throughout their lives. Um, there are a whole litany of health effects that we know with some confidence are linked to the use of industrial agrochemicals, but we don't know what, frag what proportion of those disease endpoints are attributable to specific exposures. So that's the challenge that, that we face today. What I think we can say with confidence is what we know today vastly underestimates the true costs. And I'm happy to say we've got a couple of experts in the audience, as I just have time to do the headlines. That's all I'm doing right now, the headlines. And I'm not going to couch them with scientific caveats. We can talk about the, the, where the confidence is greater and lesser as the day goes on. But only the tiniest fraction of agricultural chemicals have been studied for their health costs by independent scientists. That's a fact. Um, and the reason why I have independent scientists on there is because it's really important to have people who don't have vested interests in these issues asking the tough questions. Michael Antonio from King's College has written a brilliant analysis of why independent science matters, why you cannot trust data from people who have vested interests in these issues. I highly recommend, if any of you are following the glyphosate roundup GMO story, you need to read this paper to understand why the current approaches that governments are taking are completely inadequate. Now, I can give you the reference, or you can talk to Michael. Maybe he can say something about that as the day goes on. Um, so only a small fraction of the, of the plausible health effects have really been looked at carefully by independent scientists. So most chemicals have been studied. Most of the important epi today's epidemics of uh, most, many of them uh, endocrine-related diseases, they have not been looked at carefully. And then on using the information from those studies, very, very few efforts have been made to, to actually calculate their economic costs. And I'm happy to say that Leo Trasande is here in the audience, who's one of the leaders in this field of t learning about the attributable portion of a disease to contamination and asking what are the economic costs of that exposure. So, but I would say there's an even bigger elephant in the room. He's kind of laughing at us. Um, and that elephant is that over the last 20 years, as people have been doing what they can to understand these links, there's been a revolution unfolding in the science of environmental health that has really changed uh, our perspective of what is safe and what is not. And unfortunately, what we're learning is that the tools that we have depended upon to determine what is safe and what is not have been blind to a lot of this science. And this is the science of epigenetics and endocrine disruption. How do chemicals interfere with hormone action, which is so vital for the development of the fetus, so that that fetus winds up healthy with a functioning immune system, with a functioning metabolic system, with a reproductive system that works, with a brain that's right, correctly wired. When genes are turned on and off in development, the science of epigenetics, that is the, one of the central crucial determinants of the life of the individual, and it begins in the womb. So the United Nations takes this seriously. Uh, they issued a report in February saying endocrine disruption is a global public health threat. They didn't mince words. And they lay out the evidence for it um, and identify some of the contaminants that are involved, including industrial agrochemicals. Um, it's an excellent, I can give you the reference for that. With that, rev that revolution in science has a few key pieces to it. I can't go over all of them in seven minutes. But one of them is that low doses really matter. Parts per billion. In some cases, biological responses at parts per trillion. These are incredibly low doses. They matter. And, the, and one of the reasons, if you want to wonder why this might be the case, we're not talking about changes in DNA sequence. We're not talking about a mutation. We're talking about processes that turn genes on and off. And that happens. Hormones do that at, parts, at low parts per trillion. Chemicals that imitate hormones can certainly do it at parts per billion. So events in the womb don't stay in the womb. They last for the lifetime. You have medical disorders that are caused by fetal exposures that don't manifest until adulthood. There's some fascinating work now telling us that uh, adult uh, type 2 diabetes and also obesity 
are linked, some portion of those diseases are attributable to exposures in the womb. We don't know if it's a small proportion or a big proportion, but it's there. And the science actually, metabolic disorders and endocrine disruption has, has exploded in the last 10 years is now one of the issues of this science that's best understood scientifically. Um, like I said earlier, the tools that we've used to help us assess what's safe and what's not are just blind to most of these effects. For example, all safety assessments have been done, almost all have been done, studying one chemical at a time. But we all have hundreds of chemicals in us simultaneously. Those babies in the womb have hundreds of chemicals in them, um, man-made synthetic chemicals that were not part of human body chemistry just 100 years ago. And I'm happy to say we have one of the world's experts on the cocktail effect, Andreas Kortenkamp, here who can help us uh, through this part of the discussion. Uh, there are other assumptions that underpin regulatory testing, uh, what's safe and what's not, which we can talk about at length. Bottom line, I think there are multiple, dozens if not hundreds of safety assessments that are wrong by a factor of a thousand or more because of these false assumptions. So just one image here photo, or, uh, of one of the, those central findings in the science. Low doses do matter a lot. This is a pair of frogs mating. This is the, the lab rat of the frog world. It's called the African clawed toad or xenopus. These two rat, uh, lab rats of the amphibian world, these two frogs were exposed from hatching the, and the egg to uh, metamorphosis when they convert to adults at, to 2.5 parts per billion of atrazine, which is one of the world's most abundantly used herbicides. Now, everything looks normal until you learn that the one on the bottom is a genetic male. The, the effects of atrazine exposure at that level, which you can find in rainwater, you can find in rainwater, the effects are so profound that that male has been converted to a fully functional female that can lay eggs that can be fertilized by another male. And the scientist who does this at the University of California, Berkeley, Tyrone Hayes, now has several generations of this st strain of xenopus in which about 10% of the males undergo complete conversion to the opposite sex. So low level matters, what does that mean? This is, this is not just an issue for farm workers. It's really important for farm workers because they are bearing the, the, the first line of offense of these agrochemicals. But the, the fact that low levels work uh, are have an effect means that the contamination levels we find in today's food supply are sufficiently high to cause concern. So I'm confident the numbers are big. Like I said, I don't know if it's the Appalachians or the Rockies or the Himalayas. They're big. Um, what do we need to do now? We, know, we already have data on certain types of effects, particularly the relationship between organophosphate pesticides and IQ loss to begin assigning numbers. And some people have done that. Um, I think the numbers are, will probably expand as the science gets better. But there's some estimates that are possible now. We need to identify them, not just the OPs, but others, and, and start publishing on, on that and getting that information out. But then we've got the big unknowns, the laughing elephant in the room. Um, We've got to identify the priority endpoints. What are the really big health burdens? And I would put obesity, type 2 diabetes, uh, metabolic disorder, those are heart disease. Those are the, let, let's, let's take those big numbers and ask what fraction of them are attributable to uh, environmental, to agrochemicals. Some fraction is, we don't know if it's big or small. We have to take that list and ask, based on our biological understanding of genetic of mechanisms controlling gene expression, what are the plausible agrochemicals that are the first targets for exploration? And then we have to develop the economic analyses. I'm happy to say that with Leo's leadership and support from the National Institute of Environmental Sciences, we're actually going to be holding a workshop specifically on these issues uh, in Europe in probably April or May. Um, and I, I suspect, uh, Leo, uh, and certainly I would be willing to talk with you all about that. It's, it's a very exciting uh, development. The NIEHS is completely committed to making that happen, although not completely committed to funding it. So um, here, so thank you. 
Um, we've got some big challenges, some big opportunities. For me, the exciting part of this is as we develop our knowledge of these issues, we begin to identify places we can prevent disease and protect health and make people healthier. And that's the future. So thank you. I hope you all don't mind that we wait for questions. I have so many questions already just coming out of that brief discussion. I'm going to ask Jess Fonzo to speak next. She just took an overnight flight, so at the risk of her getting more tired as we go along, I'll ask her to come up. Jessica Fonzo is an assistant professor of nutrition at the Institute of Human Nutrition and Department of Pediatrics at Columbia University in New York. Uh, she also serves as the Senior Advisor of Nutrition Policy at the Center on Globalization and Sustainable Development. Before joining Columbia University, Jessica was the Evaluation and Monitoring Officer for the REACH Interagency Partnership at the UN World Food Program. Um, she has a very long bio. I won't read the whole bio. I'm sure uh, we will appreciate her presentation, and I know we're short on time. So, uh, Jess, you want to come up? Okay, good morning everybody. In the middle of the night for me. Um, I'm gonna talk about nutrition and agriculture systems, uh, which ironically are often not very well linked. Just to preface, I mainly work in low income countries, conflict countries. I, I, I tell my students I basically work with the other 6.7 billion people on the planet. Um, in the American academic system, we're very uh, American-centric, and so it's, uh, it's, it's important to be thinking about everyone else who's, uh, many are living in rural settings. Just to open it up, um, as, as uh, Pete had said, we have a huge issue with non-communicable diseases, chronic diseases, and one of the biggest risk factors of this is the overweight obesity pandemic. We've got about 1.5 billion people in the world who are overweight or obese. Um, this shows you the overweight and obesity patterns. This are, here's the countries with less than 10% um, of overweight and obesity. That means they're about 20 or 30% over their ideal body weight. 10 to 20%, uh, 21 to 30%, 31 to 40% are overweight or obese, 41 to 50, and then over 50%. So we have a huge, huge issue on our hands. On the other side of, of the coin, uh, we have still an incredible burden of undernutrition in the world. This is a map showing you stunting, which is a measure of chronic undernutrition. Um, so not only are children short in stature, like myself, um, but they're also stunted cognitively. Um, and this can be debilitating if you do not intervene within the first 1,000 days of life predominantly. Um, we have about 165 million children who are moderately or severely stunted living in the world that we know of. So we have these two paradoxes. We also have about a billion people who are hungry. I think it sits at about 860 million now with FAO estimates. What we do know, we have, we have the known knowns. We know that food security, um, in all of its, its pillars, availability or production, accessibility or affordability of food, and utilization, which is really the nutrition piece of food security, is very much linked to having nutrition outcomes, which has profound impacts on human development. And obviously, this feedback has a feedback mechanism on improved food security. So this is sort of a known known in theory. We know that food security and nutrition are very, very linked. And these have uh, beneficial impacts on human development if security exists. Here are the known unknowns. And this, this is predominantly, it, you can apply US or UK to this, but this is really the rest of the world, which is predominantly rural still. 
these are really the unknowns. If you look at child nutrition outcomes, I don't have a pointer at the end, or mother nutrition outcomes, who are the most vulnerable populations for both overweight and underweight, there's a lot of these unknowns that we don't understand the role of education and nutrition knowledge and behavior change, the role of income from agriculture or off-farm activities. There's a lot of these sort of pieces that we can't really link and, and further on understand the economic uh, costs to a lot of these. Um, there's pieces that we can fill in, but a lot of it is really still unknown around the world. Uh, we do know that agriculture, GDP, if you look at agriculture-led growth in countries, it's really, there's really no good pattern to assess increasing agriculture-led growth with reductions in undernutrition. Um, we do see broad impacts where countries have economic growth and we see health benefits or nutrition benefits, but the links between agriculture and nutrition are less clear. But particularly in low and middle income countries, there are a lot of, of things happening right now that I think could be lessons for the United States and the UK. And, and if you go to places like Timor-Leste or Myanmar or Nepal or Kenya, some of the places where I work, we're trying very hard with, with farmers to mitigate what we've, what we've seen happen in the United States. Um, and a lot of it is looking at food systems. There's a food system and health approach. And there's a lot of innovations, knowledge, and some evidence that's happening. Um, what we do know is that there's a lot of bundling of interventions, or what they call multi-sectoral approaches to improving nutrition. This is really uh, happening at a scale, um, at a national level in some countries. There's a lot of building of capacity at the community level where you integrate community health workers with an agriculture extension worker. They are a blending of these community type workers. You would never see that in the United States where someone comes to your door and provides primary health care and some tips on how to build your garden. We're seeing that in other places. Using technology as a delivery channel, we're seeing a lot of things like the Digital Green, which the Gates Foundation has supported to help inform farmers um, using technology. Social networks, um, a lot of community practice type platforms are, are, are being scaled up. And there's a lot of rethinking of the consumer. So the consumer is really the big angle for nutrition. And it's a really inequitable situation right now that we're in. Um, and a lot of this stems from a lack of political commitment. There's just very little equity from the consumer perspective and, and what consumers demand and what is actually there. Women, in, from the nutrition perspective, are the key consumers. Um, and they're often not targeted at all. Consumer demand is changing, I think. Uh, I think a lot of uh, people are starting to realize that it's not just at the farm gate or the producer that we need to think about, but it's actually at the other end called flipping the value chain. Don't think from production to consumption, think from consumption to production. And cost of diets. What can people actually afford? What is a nutritious diet? Um, we know that people, if they have a little bit of extra income, they will spend it on luxury foods like meat or oil or milk when they normally can't get that. So people do seek out nutritious food if they have the income. This is showing you just costs of a nutritious diet. Um, this is looking at Ethiopia, Burma, Tanzania, and the UK. The light gray is the cost of the diet per day. And this is your basic nutritious diet, just meeting the adequate nutritional needs. Um, if, and the dark gray is the income per day. So you can see in Ethiopia, Tanzania, people can't afford their basic diet. Whereas you see UK, I'm sure New York is much higher. <laughs> um, 
people can't afford that basic diet. So we're at a really inequitable situation here about, about just talking about costs of diet. So where's some of the additional research that's needed? Well, we need to still understand the impact of agriculture on nutrition. There's many unknowns on how to address nutrition that is equitable and affordable. Agriculture, for the most part, has focused on production, mass production, as we all know, and there's been very little emphasis on nutrition. I've said before, and I'll say it again, agriculture has pretty much forgotten about nutrition. Um, there's been a lot of systematic reviews that have come out recently, some in the UK, Lawrence Haddad at the Institute for Development Studies, who looked at a lot of different agriculture programs and found that there's been very little impact on nutrition, if any. We need to quantify costs and benefits. We need to cost interventions. Food-based approaches or food system solutions have not really been well costed. We know what it means to distribute a supplement. We know the cost of that. We can put it in, on uh, per, per child or even cost it out for re reductions in child mortality cost. We don't know that when it comes time to what does it cost to have a home garden in urban Brazil or rural Tanzania. We don't understand the costs of that and the benefits of that. We still are not clear. Um, we also don't know what it means or the cost of having a nutrition sensitive value chain. How do we keep nutrition from, from how do we get nutrition to enter the, the, the value chain and not exit the value chain? Losses of nutrients as they progress along the value chain. And how do we identify ways of maximizing benefits while minimizing costs? It's not well understood. Some would say that isn't it just easier to give a multivitamin, multimineral to people? This is kind of the things that, that people are wondering. And to add on to Pete, you can really say that you can put nutrition instead of toxins for the epigenetics. And what is the cost of that in the long run? Um, we know that a woman who is under or overnourished can have detrimental impacts on her offspring into adulthood, risk of non-communicable disease and obesity. Um, this is a kind of a bit of a complicated graph, but we still need additional research on, on knowledge and behavior versus affordability. How do you get behavior change? And, and what is the cost of trying to do that? We know that in the developing world context, nutrition education overall has not worked. I think we can safely say in the United States, dietary guidelines have not worked. I don't even know the dietary guidelines in the United States. I wouldn't know how to look at the my plate and be able to translate that to my own plate. Um, so how do, you ch how do you have effective knowledge and behavior change? This is a very, very black box everywhere in the world. Um, this is basically, I, I like this graph because it really shows the inequity of our food system. And, and basically, if you're poor, you have no diversity. You have no dietary diversity. You're basically consuming staples. Um, and the goal right now in agriculture around the world is to just fortify those staples through biofortification or adding back the nutrients post-processing. And it's usually one or two nutrients, which is not sufficient for the human body, which requires at least 50 nutrients and other health-promoting enhancers. So I just want to end on this slide. And I think we're talking about agriculture, you know, there's going to be a big focus on production, um, but if we're going to think about really costs, we have to think along the entire value chain. And really, this is where nutrition, the rubber hits the road. We have so many influencers along the food chain um, that can impact health, um, all of the determinants of how someone chooses a food or if they can afford a food. This is what we're dealing with from my perspective. And this is what everyone's dealing with everywhere. I spent the summer in Nepal, and this is everywhere in Kathmandu. And 
This just shows you the, re the corporate reach of where we're going. So the question I have is, what is the cost of working with industry? And what are the benefits and what are the negative associations with working with industry? We have to answer this question if we're gonna talk about food systems, public health, nutrition, not just farmers, but all of these, these multinational companies and, and even mid-sized companies that are working all over the world that are really having profound impacts on, on our health. I think I'll end there. I think that's it. Yes. <laughs> Wicked problem, yes? When you look at that slide, you realize that our food system is not really at the farmers, just at the level of the farmer, but it's such a complex system. Our last speaker is Richard Young, and Richard is the policy director at the Sustainable Food Trust. So he's kind of a homeboy, right, here at the Food Trust, uh, which he joined in October 2012. Prior to that, he led the Soil Association's campaign against the overuse of antibiotics in farming for 16 years. He played a leading role in the UK in helping to secure the EU-wide ban on the use of antibiotics for growth promotion and is currently involved in an initiative to form a global alliance to combat the threat of antibiotics resistance in both human and veterinary science. He also works on issues associated with a range of agricultural externalities and on the barriers to more sustainable agriculture. Uh, he is past editor of the journal New Farmer and Grower uh, and has authored or co-authored more than a dozen scientifically robust campaign reports. Uh, I'm pleased to invite Richard and then we're going to get into our conversation. So start getting your questions ready. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm here as a representative of the UK where we've got more money to spend on food than is good for us. And as a result of that, I'm also here as a representative of the 1.5 billion people on the planet who are overweight. But I've come to talk to you about antibiotic resistance. Um, before, I'll explain in a minute or two that um, there's a big problem about working out how much of the problem of antibiotic resistance comes from human medicine, how much comes from farming, how much comes from companion animals, and how much comes from the use or overuse of disinfectants and other things like that, which can also um, encourage antibiotic resistance to develop. Um, but I'm not an expert. I mean, I'm a, I'm a campaigner. I'm not a scientist, in case any of you misunderstand the situation. And I'm here only speaking today because Dr. Robert Martin from the John Hopkins Institute in the uh, University in America, who should have been giving this presentation, who's actually done fundamental and very important research, has got quite serious pneumonia and has had to cancel at the last minute. And he's taking strong, strong antibiotics at the moment, which is something of an irony. Uh, but of course, that's what they should be kept for, for treating those sort of serious infections, not for fattening up pigs and chickens faster than uh, is, is natural. Um, Antibiotics resistance is not the only issue to do with our overuse of antibiotics in human medicine and in farming. Um, as was just briefly mentioned, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that anti antibiotics are, are, are part of one of the factors behind the global rise in allergies, um, behind uh, one of the factors in diseases like Crohn's disease. Um, there's also strong evidence to show that they, they're actually behind the, the big rise in food poisoning bacteria in farm animals. There's some particular science to illustrate why that is the case. Most people think the antibiotics are actually suppressing them. In fact, the, the type of antibiotics used in farm animals kill off the bacteria with which, with which the food poisoning bacteria would be competing. So they give those an opportunity to expand even more. Um, um, over the last 20, now, 20 antibiotic resistance, over the last 25 years, there have been a large number of new antibiotic resistance developments. I've put a number of 10, which is actually about the number of the main ones. I'm not talking here about things like MRSA, which was around before that. I'm talking about things like extended spectrum beta-lactamase, resistant E. coli, and salmonella, and a whole range of gram-negative micro microorganisms. 
We're talking about resistance to carbapenems, which is really the, the, the best class of antibiotics of last resort, which is now spreading globally, um, and things of that magnitude. And we've seen this happening in farming in the UK. There has been a dramatic increase in antibiotic resistance in the last decade or so, and um, that's really reflect a reflection of what's happening globally. Um, during that period, there has been one new class of antibiotics developed, and they're not a particularly important class of antibiotics. And there have been no new gram-negative class of antibiotics. That's that's the class of antibiotics for which we're most particularly uh, in trouble. There are a few antibiotics still to treat MRSA, even MRSA that doesn't respond to the main drugs of last resort. But we're just about out now of antibiotics to treat E. coli, Salmonella, Klebsiella, Pseudomonas, <laughs> Acetobacter, other infections which cause major problems in people who are in long-term care facilities, in hospital undergoing cancer chemotherapy, um, having uh, organ uh, transplants, having hip and knee replacements, things of that sort. That's where the problems are arising, and that's where they're going to be most significant. The last major new class of antibiotics was in 1986. Um, there's nothing significant in the pipeline. There's one antibiotic under development which shows promise for treating one gram-negative type of infection, not a general class. The three best class of antibiotic, broad-spectrum antibiotics, that can really deal with most infections are, are um, all starting to show signs of, of cracking. Um, and the reason for this, this is uh, say, there's, there's actually much, much harder to develop new antibiotics now. We talk about peak oil, we talk about possibly peak phosphates, people argue about when that's going to come, but peak antibiotics would have been in the 1950s. We've not got, um, we've, you know, the last 20, 30 years, we've only seen the tail end of the development of antibiotics, and it's now uh, becoming critical because the, we've used up all the easy bacteria. We thought we would have antibiotics forever if resistance developed to one, we could move on to another. It's now clear that's not the case. They're sending people down coal mines and under oceans trying to find a few bacteria that might have the potential to be made into antibiotics. But then you've got a 10-year development process, no certainty the drug will be totally safe, a very great expense. And it's been said by a number of... Um, Credible scientists that, in terms of the existing antibiotics, even though we've got resistance problems to them, they're almost certainly the best antibiotics we will ever have. And so our only real alternative is to use them more carefully. Um, antibiotics is an inevitable process, but it's also linked to the, the, the more we use them, the more um, they're going to become a problem. The consequence of resistance it leads to increased level, uh, length of disease, um, increased number of infections because it takes longer for uh, the people to get better, so there's more chance of that spreading, and there are other reasons for that as well. Increased severity of infections, more bloodstream infections, and uh, longer time in hospital, more need for isolation, increased treatment failures, greater levels of death, and it's not just a problem in human medicine. In the UK and many European countries, I don't know about the US, but quite possibly there also, we're actually now seeing infections in farm animals that are resistant to all antibiotics. In the UK, uh, in East Anglia, over the last few years, over 3,000 pigs have had to be destroyed in herds where um, they had swine dysentery, which was, re was resistant to all forms of antibiotics. Now, looking at the cost for this, there have been a number of studies. In the US, I've found three studies um, coming up with estimates of $5 billion, $26 billion, and $55 billion per annum for the cost of antibody resistance. Now, you might think that the most sensational $55 billion <coughs> estimate would be from the campaigners. In fact, the campaigners put it at $5 billion. It's the Centre for Disease Control, an official government body in the US, which has put the figure $55 billion figure. And that's made up of $20 billion in terms of additional costs for treatment, hospital time, number of days in hospital, extra drugs which are more expensive, and 35 billion if you actually count in lost days at work and the impact on the economy. UK estimates range from between 3 to 11 billion pounds a year. 
the major study commissioned by our own Department of Health recently uh, has come up with this figure of probably around about 11 billion. Uh, in the EU, there's only been one study that I'm aware of puts only a figure of 1.5 billion on that, on 25 million people, sorry, 25,000 people a year dying from antibiotic-resistant infections. Hundreds of thousands of people, of course, getting them. But that study only deals with the infections for which there's data from all 27 EU countries, and there aren't very many of those at the moment. When you look at surgery for issues, like I had a knee replacement operation recently, had to have antibiotic prophylactically in order for that to be done safely. Where that goes wrong, when the antibiotics don't work, the costs go up dramatically. Um, the middle figure, not the average, but the middle figure in the range of costs per patient is $51,000 in the US uh, when you get an antibiotic-resistant infection in that situation, plus an extra $1,800 for the, for the drugs that are needed. Um, the reason it's been a low priority for until now, even if you look at the $55 billion figure in the US, it seems quite small compared with other health costs, cardiovascular disease, uh, mental disorders, substance abuse and so on, all in the two to $300 billion a year um, category. However, all these costs in the literature are huge underestimates, as has been pointed out by British scientists in the last year for our Department of Health, because all they're doing is looking at the additional treatment costs, how much longer in hospital, what, how much more the antibiotics cost, that sort of thing. They have not costed in, as scientists have pointed out now, that the real problem here is that because we're not able to develop antibiotics now as fast as we're developing resistance, we're actually moving towards a system where unless we do something about it, the healthcare system that we have in developed countries will break down completely and no one has actually tried to put costs on that. And if we look at, for example, sexually transmitted diseases, the gonorrhea now uh, is resistant to all antibiotics, but fortunately, it's not yet resist. Not every strain is resistant to all antibiotics, so most of them can now be developed. But the type of resistance which has been found in gut bacteria in E. coli is a type of resistance that could make gonorrhea completely untreatable, uh, or except by intravenous injections in hospital of toxic drugs which would kill half the patients. So uh, if that happens, and we're preciously close to it happening, as has been predicted by some scientists, we will already have a really major global health problem. Um, I'll rush through this. That's looking just an example of hip replacements, how much extra it costs. Now, with farm antibiotic use, this is where it gets difficult, trying to apportion the, the amount that goes to different sectors. We know that uh, roughly globally, something over half of all antibiotics are given to farm animals and just under half to humans. In the UK, it's a little bit less than that. But... 120 out of 178 countries have no control over farm antibiotic use at all. It's the antibiotics are simply sold like other commodities, like food. About 90% of farm antibiotics are put in feed or water, mostly for pigs or poultry, though the routine use of antibiotics in dairy production shouldn't be ignored. It becomes a major problem through the feeding of waste milk to calves. Um, and 49% of countries still allow antibiotic growth promoters. Uh, these are just an example of how antibiotics are promoted. Now, uh, in Europe, actually since October, Britain has now finally banned the use of advertising antibiotics direct to farmers like this. It only came after a 10-year campaign, which I've been involved with. We finally managed to get this banned. Um, but this is how antibiotics are still effectively being promoted globally to the farming community because it's going on on the internet, the even more professional adverts there which farmers can access. If you go to a farming website, you'll get links to these type of advertisements. And the drug companies are now organising seminars for farmers to teach them about being responsible with antibiotic use, of course, which is good, but they're promoting their products at the same time. These are two products which are closely linked to causing resistance in dr drugs of last resort. This one on the, on the left-hand side, where you can see it's added to the drinking water of pigs, is cross-resistant to a, an antibiotic called linzeolid, which is a drug which is used when you get res vancomycin-resistant MRSA. So we're looking right at the top of the spectrum. And this is examples of antibiotics for routine prophylactic use in farm animals which still have growth promoting effects are still going on in, in, in Europe as well as in North America and elsewhere. Um, 
we have to be honest and say that a large number of infections that, that are resistant, like tuberculosis, a lot of respiratory infections in hospitals, have got nothing at all to do with farm antibiotic use. The major problems are in the food poisoning bacteria in E. coli, which uh, causes 40,000 uh, blood poisoning cases a year in the UK now, and about 7,000 deaths, but actually causes about one and a half million infections of which now about 40% are resistant to the antibiotics which doctors would want to give to people. When we're talking here about things like urinary tract infections. And because a lot of those don't respond to antibiotics, a proportion of those people end up in hospital having to be given antibiotics of last resort. MRSA is now found in farm animals widely around the world, and that's a ticking time bomb because although at the moment it's not as serious a strain of MRSA, there are already signs that it's mutating and will become a major community-acquired type of MRSA. Um, and the farm use of critically important antibiotics for human medicine has actually contributed, we know already, to resistant infections in humans. The type of research that still, we still need to do we, we need to have a much better idea of how much of the problem is coming from hospitals, how much from GPs. Actually, in the UK, GPs give, prescribe 80% of the antibiotics for human medicine. Hospital doctors, only about 20%. In my experience, is the hospital doctors are actually more responsible. Um, we need to know much more about how, much it's going, how it's actually going to affect um, uh, the, the sort of situations where we're now using antibiotics for a whole range of things uh, which will be no longer possible. And we also need to do some better research into alternatives to antibiotic misuse. We need to know a better idea about the con contribution of food, the contribution of the environment. There have been some studies recently showing that antibiotic-resistant bacteria, including MRSA, have been found at high, fairly high concentrations, up to a mile away from intensive livestock farms, simply in the air that we all breathe. Um, and we need a better idea about the link between increasing resistance and increasing levels of infection. Uh, policy instruments that can be used, we really need a global ban on the use of antibiotics for growth promoting. That could not, cannot be justified in today's world. Um, I believe that we also should have a ban on all preventative use of antibiotics in healthy animals, except where there's a very specific case in relation to surgery. Um, we, we should try to make low antibiotic use a cross-compliance me me mechanism. It, many of you won't know, perhaps, but in the European Union, farmers have to observe a whole range of cross-compliance criteria in order to qualify for subsidies, like you, you, you know, how you look after your hedge, hedgerows, um, whether you allow soil erosion to occur, that sort of thing. And in the, Denmark has led the European Union by introducing what they call a yellow card scheme, where farmers who use more than a certain amount of antibiotics every year actually get a warning, and if they go ahead and don't take note of that, they can actually ban from producing food. Um, there's a strong case for taxing antibiotics, but in practice what's happening is that due to farm lobbying, the price of antibiotics is coming down. And we need to encourage research into non-antibiotic treatments. Um, I think really all I need to say here is that um, reducing, you know, we, we, this is the, the real true cost of this is something that we can't actually put a figure on. Um, but that reducing antibiotic use in humans and animals should be seen as an insurance policy against that type of catastrophic event. I won't uh, bore you with the, the rest of it. Okay, thank you. If we could get all our speakers up here and the hand mics, that would be great. Why don't you hold this one and let me... Oh, yeah, great. I was just going to... We might need a mic... We might need a mic. Uh, is this on? Yeah, we need for the questions. So let's just open it up right now for a quick round of questions. Um, what are we missing here that folks want to put into the conversation? I think we've had a great spectrum of issues, um, antibiotics, um, pesticides, endocrine disruption, chronic conditions in the and the uh, nutrition, 
what are we missing when we think of food systems and public health that we might just want to put on the table um, or any specific questions to any of the speakers? Let's start there. And if you could introduce yourself, that'd be great. Uh, my name is Owsley Brown, and uh, my question is specific to, um, I guess, yields, overall yields, as it relates to having enough food to feed everybody on this earth today, as well as the projections for population growth and how that relates to our capacity to feed this planet in a healthy way, certainly. Uh, and what's behind my question is people who are making the argument that only through, let's say, industrial agriculture can we actually feed everybody on this earth. So I'm wondering if maybe we could add uh, that into this conversation. Who wants to take that question? Anybody? Um, yeah, this is kind of the million dollar question, right? How are we going to feed the planet? And I think in its current state, if you look places like India or Brazil or even parts of the United States, right now we have enough food, but it's just very inequitably distributed um, for lots of reasons, political, geographically. You go to Nepal and you can't even get to some of the regions of Nepal and you have to fly in food, basically, food aid, um, which is not sustainable. But I mean, I think, I think the question remains, how can we feed the planet? Um, and I think people are largely in agreement that if we go up to 9 billion, now projected to be about by 2035, I think they're saying, um, which is very scary, um, we will need to increase the supply of food. My argument always is though, is how are we gonna feed the planet well? We haven't, that hasn't entered the equation as, as far as I know. And it's disturbing to me that we're gonna continue to try to improve and intensify rice, wheat, um, and maize, basically. Um, so for me, I think what's completely left out of that argument is, is, is the, well, the wellness part of the feeding part. I don't even like the word feeding. I feel like we're feeding cows from a trough or something. Um, but so to me, it's, it's an argument that I think will sit amongst people who believe in conventional agriculture, for those who believe more in sustainable agriculture. I mean, I work with some agronomists who very much believe in conventional farming, fertilizer, technology for Africa. I mean, my former boss, Jeffrey Sachs, is very much in agreement with that. Um, but I believe that there's gonna be a lot of mixed systems around the world, and I don't think there's going to be one solution for the entire planet. If you go to different parts of the world, you're not gonna be able to have a, a cookie cutter approach. Um, some farmers want technology, others don't. Um, and who are we to deny that farmer? Um, what was that? <laughs> so I think it's gonna be, it's gonna be farmer preferences, um, different systems, different agro-ecosystem demands, ecological services, so um, I don't think it's a simple answer. That's, that's my take on it. But I just wish that the wellness part was part of the, that debate, the current debate. So let's take some more questions and comments. We're not gonna be able to have lengthy answers. We have about, I have about 15 minutes for questions, so hardly enough time, so Tim. Hello, uh, my, my, name is, my name is Tim Crosby. I have a question about the type of research. Uh, there was mention about individual research on individual chemicals, and that's not real to the practical realities. And I'm wondering how to, change that to the function of two directions. One is to the professionals and businesses that may need peer-reviewed research, and then to the public that does nev never looks at peer-reviewed research. I've dealt with direct causal relationship problems when you present a system of issues and people won't accept the system approach because you can't isolate the variables. Uh, and what I saw in the research or the, the slides was 
a need for that other type of research? Is there a good pathway, something that is being accepted as that new form of research and a system of issues? Um, I, I think that um, what we need to do is move towards a, a system, and this is really what the Prince of Wales actually envisaged right at the beginning, where we get a major institution to to, to tackle this and, and to, 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 to take on this sort of study. Um, as, we, as I think we've, I've seen in trying to put figures together, and I'm sure others have found it as well, it's a very patchy picture. We don't have enough research at the moment. Um, and this is really one of the things we want to come out of this, this whole event, I think, is to uh, uh, create the momentum for moving towards that, that sort of major study to bring all these ex-analysis together. Uh, that's a great question, Tim. Um, I, I think that we've got to think about this in, in stages. Um, we have to ask, what are the, the findings, the poster children findings that can begin to grab the public's attention? We've got to focus on what, wh where they are and how to communicate about them to, the broader, to a broader public. That, that's, that's part of a, of a strategy that, that begins to get, begins to grab public attention. Then you then use that that momentum to to organize the resources to move to the more systematic approach that is much more complicated, much more expensive. I think it's a multi-staged approach: poster children, public attention, pressure to move more systematically. And Pete, does that mean pick a few things? Is that what you're trying to say when you say I think momentum so. building? I think so. Uh, maybe there are. Maybe you're more of a campaigner than I. I'm not a campaigner, but. I've watched lots of campaigns. Mm -hmm. it, it struck me that effective ones begin with poster children yeah. that grab public attention. Yeah, pick a few things. Um, Daniel, right? Okay. Hi, uh, I'm Daniel Fujiwara. Um, I'm very new to the food stuff. My background's more in valuation of externalities and non-market goods. Um, and so I just have a question and kind of comment um, based on the trends that we're seeing in other areas. So if it, my background is mainly in kind of looking at employment um, and social and externalities related to employment. Um, so I, I thought kind of, you know, the, the first steps in the true cost accounting stuff um, was great. You're starting to look at, you know, the, the larger, the costs associated. But my, my main question is around um, the focus purely on kind of public or exchequer purse savings or, you know, uh, exchequer related savings. Um, so if you do that, you get some perverse results. So for example, in the employment case, um, in the UK, we used to um, value someone getting into a job by the reduction of, of, of benefit payments and the increase in that person's wages. But work that we've been doing recently has found that the actual, the, the individual um, kind of benefit, i.e. reduction in anxiety, reduction in depression, better health, is kind of 10 times that value. So if you incorporate that, we should be putting a lot more money into getting people into jobs. And in terms of kind of the health and, and food side, there's, there's another perverse effect, which is kind of if you look at obesity. So if you have more obese people, the um, public costs actually tend to fall because you don't have to look after them in later life. So there's actually a positive effect on the public purse of having more obese people. Okay? In the short term, no. But in the long term, you don't have to care for them in care homes and things like that. But obesity is a huge negative impact on a person's individual lifestyle and their feelings. And if we capture that, it becomes a negative effect rather than a positive effect. <coughs> so my, my main issue is around you know, moving away just from the um, exchequer-related savings and thinking about the full individual impacts as well to give you a, a full kind of true cost or benefit to society. That, that's why we're glad you're in the room. Yeah. <laughs> because uh, we're at the alpha stage of this work. Mm -hmm. We know that there's a lot of complications. Uh, twists and turns in the story, your experience in the, the employment world are, can certainly help inform us as we move forward here. Yeah, and I think, you know, constantly putting in your mind the question of who pays is gonna be really important. If we're always shifting to the public sector, well, people think, okay, that's the public sector, but if it's the educational system, it's individual impacts, population level impacts at another level, um, I think we have a more powerful story to tell than simply it's the economic impact in the public sector. I know in the US, if you look at externalities of diabetes, for example, at least 10 years ago, um, the impact was in the Medicare system. In other words, it was in the system that the government paid for. 
after people you know, became 65 years old. So the private systems and all the other systems really didn't care because the public system was gonna take care of it. But now as we see type two diabetes in every younger populations, there, there's more attention. Um, Anne. My name's Ann Thrupp, and I'm with the Berkeley Food Institute at UC Berkeley in California. And um, I just uh, wanted to first make a brief comment on this last, last point, which is that, in fact, um, obesity has really proven to have significant increase in hospitalizations and in healthcare costs because of the effects on, as she alluded to, um, and Marion alluded to, with diabetes and heart disease. And in fact, my, my comment was related to that because I wanted to ask the panelists about what to me is a very interesting trend in this whole area of food and um, nutrition and health impacts from different types of, uh, well, the chemicals as well and, and resistance is the growing interest of um, insurance companies. Um, one of the things that we've begun to see is the increasing interest by um, uh, private insurance companies um, that are very concerned about who's bearing the cost. And in fact, they are bearing many of the costs. And that has motivated hospitals and doctors to really take this whole issue of unhealthy food more seriously. Likewise, the issue of antibiotics. And about the increasing resistance, they're starting to scrutinize the doctors to say, you know, how many antibiotics are you actually prescribing? Now, I think there's just a small number of insurance companies that are really paying attention to this, but I think it's a very positive trend to really call attention to the public um, about, you know, about this issue. And I'm just wondering if any of you have had any experience with dealing with that, um, and also whether you think that the insurance companies can play a role in pressuring policymakers. Um, I, I would say absolutely yes, and I, I'd like to report to you all that the, the reinsurance industry um, and if you understand the, the ecology of insurance, you know that there are the companies that are insured by the insurance companies, and then the insurance companies are insured by the reinsurance industry, like Swiss Re, for catastrophic, catastrophic losses that, uh, to the insurance companies. The, uh, there's a forum of chief risk officers of the reinsurance industry, headed by David Cole, who is the chief risk officer for Swiss Re, and a, a year ago, they issued a recommendation that uh, companies reduce their use and release of endocrine disrupting compounds because of the potential of catastrophic loss. Um, and that is a huge signal. When the reinsurance, reinsurance industry began to pay attention to climate change and the potential for catastrophic loss in climate change, it, that suddenly thrust this squarely into the financial sector. And now we're beginning to see SEC filings that reflect vulnerability because of carbon commitments. This move by the Chief Risk Officers Forum doesn't guarantee that will happen in this issue, but it begins to create a path forward. Right, and I, if I just might also comment, I think one of the most innovative um, innovators in this area is, uh, is Kaiser Permanente Hospital, and they're of course combined insurance and um, and hospital service in, in now throughout the United States. But they have really taken seriously a lot of these issues about the so-called you know, externalities or the costs that are, are associated with food that is poor as well as antibiotic resistance, um, chemical um, exposures. Yeah. And they are doing studies to sh and taking preventive measures in healthy foods and reducing chemical exposures and training their doctors on all of these things. And um, I just you know, really think that those best practices that are emerging from certain areas can push this dialogue much more quickly to realize that this is not just a, a social cost borne by, um, you know, by our agencies, but really are borne by you and me as we pay our insurance. I just want to add on to what you were saying. I, I think it's a great idea, and it's in, in Kaiser Permanente, I think, is maybe an exception. Because in general, I don't think health professionals are at all trained in areas of uh, nutrition. Nutrition's always called, you know, everybody's business, but nobody's responsibility. And it, nutrition is not nursing or doctor curriculum. And I think it's a, a worry in America where we have, you know, 60% of adults who are overweight or obese. And obesity is a complicated biological 
process that's highly influenced by society and environmental cues. And I don't think doctors know what to say. I was at a conference called Diabesity about a few weeks ago, and some of the top experts in obesity research. And basically, they're, they said diet and exercise does not work. And the only thing that works is uh, drugs that profoundly impact neurological pathways, like your dopamine receptor, or bariatric surgery. That's where America's going. Yeah. There is no training at all or incentive, incentives it, for doctors to start working on or thinking about nutrition. I want to go back. I mean, this is, I mean, I, I'm in New York City at Presbyterian yeah. so, Hospital, the biggest hospital that serves the most impoverished neighborhoods that, and the most obese, obviously. And there's nothing well, on nutrition. I guess it's all across the board then, because there, there are different approaches. Well, I do want to go back to what you said about Kaiser Permanente, because they have been a leader uh, in a movement called Healthcare Without Harm which is an international movement to get the health professionals, particularly the HMOs and their variations around the world, to begin asking what are the practices within hospitals that we can change to make people healthier? And they're affecting billion, uh, over $100 billion of buying purchases by hospitals to move in this direction, better nutrition, fewer chemicals, better health. And yeah. Kaiser took the lead because they have a lifetime experience with their patients, their patients stick to them throughout their lives, and therefore the, the investments they make in prevention early pay off later.